uh, it's your host, Kevin. And uh, Terrence, he should be here shortly. But until then, um, I'm just going to talk about some of the things I've, I've got going on and how I've been keeping productive to, you know, pass time during these layoffs. So, you know, layoffs are traumatic for everybody, but <clears throat> that doesn't mean that you should just sit around uh, moping, being depressed, or being down. You have to find a way to maintain your productivity. And one of the things I've really been doing is focusing on the Coder Conversations website. So if you go to coderconvos.com, you'll see, um, you know, you can watch all the, all the latest episodes. You can sign up for the newsletter. And we're going to continue to add features. We also have a message board, but that's not uh, ready to be unveiled just yet. And we're still working on the login functionality. But, you know, something I realized is that um, you have to start building outside of your current job. Because if you don't, once you get let go, you're going to have nothing to show for it other than, you know, the little bit of money that you earned. So um that's really what i've been um focusing on is getting the coder conversations website going you know i want to start developing these um alternative sources of income because otherwise you know you just get laid off and then you're screwed and as you can see the the, the tech industry is very very unstable and that's something that a lot of people aren't telling you if, if you're wanting to jump in. I'm not here to discourage you, but I'm here to give you the reality of what's going on. You know, the company I work for, um, their stock was increasing. They just signed a massive deal, but yet there were still layoffs. I still got laid off. So, you know, there's no real way to predict these layoffs. Usually if you hear mergers and acquisitions, though, that means somebody's getting laid off. But all the advice that I've been giving you guys, you know, I've been applying it and it's, it's been helping me in, the, in this challenging economy. I stay visible on LinkedIn. I'm doing things outside of work. All of that helps. <clears throat> all of that helps, you know, in, in an economy like this where it's extremely difficult to find a job. Let's see. But yeah, guys, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Let's see. Hey, how's it going, uh, Alicia? Yeah, no, I got uh, laid off from Broadcom. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was working at Caliber last year, but fortunately, I was able to leave before they started uh, laying everybody off. And then, you know, I was here at Broadcom for about a year. And, uh, yeah i got caught in these layoffs so now i'm kind of uh, in between jobs but yeah i appreciate you for uh tuning in uh, how have you been doing alicia so um <clears throat> yeah terrence he should be here in a little bit but yeah, until then. So some of the other things I got going on, I'm working on an application with my friends. It's uh, an Amazon app. Uh, it helps uh, sellers on Amazon determine which products are profitable. I got that going on. I have the um, Coda Convos website. I'm, I'm starting to get into merchandise. Um, hold up. Give me one second, guys. We have a guest that's about to come on. Hey, what's going on, Jonathan? Uh -huh. oh, hey, Kevin, how are you? I'm doing well. How you been doing, man? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. It's good to hear from you, too. Oh, man, glad to have you on. It's been a while, man. What's been new with you? Man, um, well, uh, I mean, the topic of layoffs, right? It's real relevant. I was laid off just uh, three months ago, so I fully understand. I know the grind's rough right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I think I was laid off three months ago, Um 
I was interviewing nonstop and uh, one of the companies I interviewed with called Alchemy Labs. Um, they extended me an offer. And so I started with them in July. And then I briefly did a co- like a contract to like try to hold me over, um, you know, in between the two gigs. But uh, yeah, at the moment, I'm kind of just in that holding pattern, trying to, you know, keep the funds I got from the contract. And then I'm just waiting to start my new full time gig. But yeah. So are you uh, back in the gaming industry? Or are you doing something kind of uh, different until then? Yeah, so Alchemy Labs, they make VR games, and I think their big one is Job Simulator. Um, and so um, so uh, I'm going to be helping them make whatever is next, which I'm really excited about. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, Alicia, to answer your question, I do build websites. Um, so yeah, if you need something built, just uh, let me know. But yeah, man, um, w- was there any signs before you got laid off from your current job, or did that just kind of happen out of nowhere? Right. I'm kind of 50 50, right? Because I think I've been through enough layoffs that like the the temperature started to feel a little familiar, right? Like, Mm -hmm. oh, okay, things are less organized than they usually are. Or or, um, I noticed, you know, before we'd have these big company wide meetings, we're doing X, Y, and Z, we're doing all these big initiatives. And then those meetings kind of dried up and we're not talking much about much as much about what the future looks like. And so small stuff, but stuff that's like, well, I mean, it's a business, you know, there's things happen constantly, right? There are just times where like things aren't moving as quickly and there's times where lots of stuff is happening. Um, so just small stuff. I was like, that feels a little bit funny, but we'll see. Um, and then uh, the actual layoff itself, that, that blindsided me. Like I was, yeah, yeah. I was not expected it that morning. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, it was rough. That was rough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know what you mean, man. Uh, there's always like the little signs, but mm-hmm. you know, right. uh, you don't want to believe it until it happens. But at my last job it was so obvious. I couldn't ignore it. Like all the higher ups were leaving, and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions. Right. But, you know, with this one, I didn't expect it because like the stock was doing so good. And, uh, but you know, I guess if they don't have funding for the project and they don't, you know, they just don't have it. So right, right. How, how did you keep yourself occupied uh, after, after the layoff? Yeah, right. Well, there, uh, I mean, I had to, I had to like, uh, play as many games as I could for a minute, right? Like I did have to just, cause that's my like way to decompress. So I played a lot of games. Um, but I also like I kind of almost immediately like and I'd I'd had some feelings about my job anyway. So I was updating like my portfolio, my resume and I'm um, just kind of like updating my online presence. And then uh, when it happened, it was kind of like thankfully everything was updated and it was just kind of sending my resume to any and everyone who might look at it. Um, just trying to find as many job openings and listings as I could um, interviewing. I interviewed nonstop. Um, which uh which you know it, it can be it can be challenging but i just needed to find something and um yeah um so yeah lots of games and lots of interviews i was yeah 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 i know what you mean man mm-hmm. uh been doing a little bit of gaming myself call of duty and oh, uh, yeah. final fantasy 16. hey what's going on terrence i'm excited but yeah uh, you do you have a ps5 uh jonathan Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm I'm excited for nine o'clock tonight. I think Final Fantasy sixteen oh, okay. is live, so I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Did, did you try the demo, or did you just are you just gonna kind of wait to play it? I uh, I wasn't even gonna. I wasn't. It wasn't even really on my radar. And then a friend told me about the demo, and I was like, okay, all right, I got to give it a shot. And then I played it, and it it snatched my attention. And so um, so yeah, um, after the demo, I was sold. I was like, okay, I I, I you know I. I've been, I don't think I've been as in love with Final Fantasy in a long time, but after playing that demo, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm into this. Like, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. They, they kind of bringing it back. Like, uh, mm-hmm. the, the past few been kind of disappointing, but mm-hmm. after playing, after playing that demo, man, it's, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. it's probably the best demo I've played, like, mm-hmm. maybe ever. I agree. I agree. <laughs> mm-hmm. and Terrence doesn't have his PS5 yet, so he's going to be on the waiting list. He's a PC gamer. That for sure. PC master race and all that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Terrence, you on uh, mute? Okay, my bad. There yes, we go. Me? Yeah. So it's not about the PC master race. I won't, <laughs> like, 
Like I'm not like oh, I want to play it at 4K, you know, on my 4090 or whatever. Like, like I'm 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 not about that life. I don't I don't have the drive to go out and spend you know a couple grand on a graphics card. But it's just I find it convenient right now. Like I was down with like buying every console and yeah. you know getting the exclusives. But like uh, after I got my nephew a PS5 like a couple years ago when the when, when it was locked down mm-hmm. and I played it and it, you know I played Spider-Man on it and it was cool but ever since then like that itch to play a PS5 or like have one just I don't I don't have that same itch for it and like whenever I see games come out for PS5 I'm like okay I'll, I'll wait for it to come out on PC <laughs> if, if it comes out on PC mm-hmm. like I'm still waiting for um, like I waited for Returnal okay boom that dropped I waited for um Ratchet and Clank is coming out in July, like, uh, and then any, like, I don't control piracy, but, like, any other Ratchet and Clank or something else that I want to play, I could play it on, on PC at, at, like, 4K or whatever. Um, it, but there are AAA titles that I'm just like, okay, that would be nice on, on PC. Like, God of War was excellent. Like, my first playthrough of God of War was really, it was great. Like, from start to finish, I cried. It was a great game. Uh, I'm waiting for Ragnarok. And um, yeah, the long and short of it, yeah, you know, Final Fantasy 16 is gonna come out. I won't, I won't be on the, oh, you know, I'll be on the waiting list for for when it drops. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid spoilers as much as possible, and and if I really feel the itch, I'll, I'll watch a playthrough online. But you know, uh, I don't think, I don't know, like it's uh, how do you, how do you not to not to steal the the spotlight, but like how do you guys feel about like playthroughs or walkthroughs or like, like do you guys like, are you guys for it? Are you against it? How do you guys feel about it? Uh, man. Uh, I mean, if I don't plan on playing the game, I will watch it ahead of time. But yeah, I don't want to spoil myself. Yeah, yeah. I feel I'm. Well, I'm. I'm seven. And I do. I watch games like I know I'm not gonna play because there's only so many hours in a day, right? And right. Like, game might have a really dope story, but it's like I'm. I'm not playing. And mm-hmm. so then I'll watch a playthrough, especially like late night or during work. Like, I think that's my kind of top times to watch those. Have you been playing D4? Uh, not me. No, I know that's a big time sink kind of game. Diablo 4. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, I, I've i seen people play Diablo. I haven't really been big into Diablo. I think that's a really niche niche type of uh, title. Uh yeah, I'm 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 in the same boat as Kevin. Like, I just never got pulled into those type of games. Um, and I know that they're really big time sinks, mm-hmm. or like not time. I don't want to say time sinks, but they're very much. They're the kind of games where that like, you have to get to a certain point for mm-hmm. things to get really good, and I or at least so I've heard. Like, oh, after hour thirty or after hour forty, it gets really good. And I'm just like, that's a commitment. Like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, them, them games like you got to be dedicated to really get ahead, kind of like World of Warcraft. People be like losing their marriages because they just play that non stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of games, and, uh, and I think we're kind of we're heading in a direction, I, I think, of like uh, like uh, monetization and gaming right now, like how games are now versus like back then. Like back then, I could buy a cartridge or I could buy a CD. And that's the whole game, you know. Right. Maybe in the future they, they would like they would like uh, what's the word like like silently patch out certain things, you know. Like oh, if you bought the black version of the game or the green label version of the game, it would be slightly different, maybe. But like, I just think that nowadays a lot of games are, are not, that have that they have that games as a service type of feel where you're not buying you're buying like a platform. And then they just sort of spoon feed you content as the as the service continues on. And I feel like uh, the point I'm trying to make is is that games come incomplete now, and you yeah. you you have to get to a certain point where a lot of the DLC is out, and then the game improves and all the bugs are fixed, and then it, and then it becomes a, a solid experience versus just getting a solid experience from the start and and then getting solid DLC afterwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Jonathan, I, I, cause you, you, you work in the gaming industry. Mm-hmm. Like how, how does, uh, how do you feel about releasing a product that's half finished? 
or or at least for the consumer it's it might not be the the final vision of the product how do you feel yeah right it's frustrating right like it's it's frustrating right because and the, the reality is i think the call isn't usually on us right usually the call is someone who got paid way more than we do um who is way removed from the game development process who doesn't who isn't that interested in games we're like yeah so we're gonna drop on april 4th and the rest of us go well it's february and that feels a little aggressive and they're like well i don't know the contract i signed said april 4th so you gotta figure it out yeah. right and so um so it could be a bummer to be on that end and have to like uh, you know release something you know isn't the game as it's intended and you know that's why so many games come with the day one patches right that's like the yeah. way to try to save it because even you know if you think about how many games are broken with the day one patch and imagine like by the time that like without the day one patch it was ultra broken right yeah. um and so uh so yeah it's it's not it's it's not a great look and as a gamer i hate it personally right because i totally agree with you right i i paid you the 60 or 70 dollars today i deserve the full complete experience at launch right yeah you know? yeah <laughs> yeah yeah man that's you know and it's crazy games are like really expensive now it's like 70 dollars yeah. for the base edition then they got yeah. the digital uh deluxe edition is like uh 90 dollars i'm like wow right right mm -hmm. yeah which is um yeah yeah which is i i just wish kind of kind of to your point terrence i just wish if you know i'm it's not the end of the world to me games cost 70 dollars, right i think they've hovered around 60 for a while but uh but i i just think that then our expectations for what a day one release should be like higher as fans like we deserve more higher quality day one experiences if you want to tack on a higher price tag right exactly I made, I made a uh, controversial statement uh, on a message board earlier today. I said uh, 2023 might be the best year for gaming. What, what do y'all think? So, yeah. Uh, Street Fighter <laughs> 6, Armor Core, Diablo so, 4. As far as, like, bangers, I feel like there are really, like, solid hits, right? We've got, like, right. Jedi Fallen Order. I mean whatever the survivor, Jedi Fallen Survivor, I don't know the title. Yeah, Jedi Survivor, yeah. 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 Fallen. yeah. Uh, we've got Star Wars, we've got Final Fantasy, we've got Zelda, uh, Zelda, Zelda, Tears of the yeah. Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, shoot, what else? Um, Super Mario RPG, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm so this, excited for that. Is that this year? Yeah. Uh, I think so. I think like they said, November. yeah, November, October, somewhere in there. I think, I think you're at November. Yeah, so I mean, there's that, right? Nintendo's got bangers, Sony's got bangers, uh, Star Starfield. Starfield dropping. Starfield, there we go. Yeah, like, that's that's dropping. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good year. I think it's yeah. a really solid year for for gamers. Yeah. Uh, is it the best year? I don't know. I don't really memorize when years. You know, mm -hmm. like like you know, to me, uh, yesterday PS One just came out. And you had Final Fantasy VII, and now <laughs> tomorrow we've got Final Fantasy XVI. So, you know, everything's a blur at us after a certain point. Right. It's crazy. Right. At least nine since then. Isn't yeah. it? Mainline entries. Right. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, th I actually, I think I would agree with you, Kevin. Yeah. I think it, and it's because it's funny because I think the way you year started off, we had Redfall, we had Gollum, right? I feel like there's something else that just came out and was a, a trash fire, Flop. right? Yeah. Right. And so um Zelda, I was like, okay, this is good. I felt like that saved kind of a, a way we were hidden and saw the Starfield preview, which looks amazing. Um, this Final Fantasy 16 demo, like I'm super excited to play 16. I think it's gonna be one of my favorites in the series. I'm um, just after playing that demo, right? And then yeah, to your point, right? Armored Core, all the other stuff. Yeah, I'm really I, I hear amazing stuff about Diablo. Yeah, I think it's gonna be one of the best years I can remember. I think the last year. To me, the best year of games I can remember was, I think there was a year Metal Gear Solid 3 came out. I think it was Metroid Prime 2, and I think it was Halo 2. And like to mm. me, that's like that was a year of games that I absolutely loved. Um, but this is this is I think this is one for the record books. Like I'm really excited. Yeah, this this, is, this, is, this one's uh, competitive. Uh, mm -hmm. Zelda, Diablo, mm -hmm. um, what else was there? Final Fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's just so so many good mm -hmm. games, man. Death Mortal Space Kombat. 
Oh, Mortal Kombat, yeah. And Street Fighter Six, yeah, which is Street amazing. Fighter Six. Mm -hmm. Dead Space dropped. Oh, Dead yeah, Space. Dead Space. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Hollow Knight might come out this year. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. We'll see. <laughs> see. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm all for more Hollow Knight. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. Like, I, but I don't want to pressure those devs. Like, sure. after seeing the first one and how, uh, how well it was. Like, I came, I, I came at the tail end where you buy it for like a cheap price and you get all the DLC and everything. But like. The Hollow Knight is such a great game, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't want that game to come out in a state where it's just like you have to have a, a press release, you know, the, the image that says, sorry, guys, right. we're working on a day, <laughs> you know, day 30 patch or whatever. Yeah, right. Take your time. Like, if you have to push that game back, like, please, by all means, like, push it back. Just wait. Right. Now, Terrence, can you see yourself working in the game industry? No. Because <laughs> he's saying that's I, why. I, I, like, like, do I love gaming? Yeah, but do I want to? Like, I wouldn't want to. I love gaming as a hobby, as a way to like, to like when I'm done with work, like it's it's separate from like yeah. from my actual day to day work. If I had to combine the two, yeah. I feel like it would just make my my love of gaming like just. I, I I would just lose it. I would lose my love of gaming. I feel, or or I I could easily. How do I say it? I don't know. If, I don't know if you feel this way, Kevin. But like, do you ever go to a website now and you're like, why would they do that? Why would they design? <laughs> why would they design this this way? Like, this doesn't make sense, or this is mm -hmm. this doesn't feel right. Like, do you ever experience that? Yeah. Like, well, like, what kind of? Why? Why did they do it like that? Like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like. So like even what was it? I was on uh, HBO when HBO Max just redesigned their their branding to just say Max and everything, mm. and they read they mm. released a new version of their video app, and so I'm on it, and I'm like, oh that's cool, and like like oh what is it? Like it was a trailer of Avatar playing. I was like, oh the the button, I mean the icon when you hover over it, like it's a it's a timer thing, and I started explaining it. My mom is just like, okay, I guess like you're being, you're being a nerd, but it's because I've seen so many galleries that like now when I look at an app, like when they do something like a little bit different, it's like it stands out to me. Like I I notice it as as a developer, right? Yeah. But I think if I was to step into video game dev, mm -hmm. I would just start to think like. I would have to. I would have to deconstruct the game. I would, have, I would have to. Yeah, I would like break it down. Like, oh, why they do this this way? Like, this is so unintuitive. Or, I feel like it would taint. Uh, if I saw how the sausage was made, I would not enjoy the sausage. If that, if that, <laughs> right. makes, if that makes the most sense. Like, yeah. Like, I don't want to see how the sausage is made. Just, just you know, just hand me a controller and and let me press buttons and pretty pretty stuff happens and right. that's it. Does being like behind the scenes and seeing how some of this stuff is accomplished, does that does that ever ruin things for you, Jonathan? It kind of. So you're, you're totally spot on, right? I definitely have undressed games before, right? And especially, I feel like it's almost a quality level thing, right? I I think there's games that I'm like, I know I could make this versus like you know I I'm so I'm 170 hours into Tears of the Kingdom, right? And every the time I play, like I learn something new about the game or I see something new and it just blows my mind over and over again uh, about how much, you know, details gone into it, right? And I think I would say the same thing about Street Fighter VI. There's so many really awesome game design decisions made there. Um, you know, even Final Fantasy, like kind of to your point, Kevin, right? Like it, like it feels like in a lot of ways it's taken some of the old things we love and it's taken some new things and it's putting it together to make something really spectacular. And so that stuff makes me fall in love with games all over again, right? Because it turns me back. I always think back to like 10 year old me who on a Saturday morning, first thing I did when I got up would be to plop on the floor and camp out in front of the TV um, if I didn't have to clean up, if my mama wasn't going to make us clean up the house that day or something, right? Uh, but so like when games do that to me, like, you know, it's a really awesome and magical experience. But then there are the moments where I'm like, I play something, I'm like, oh, I don't know why we, we chose that choice, right? Or this could have worked better here or, um, or you know, and it, maybe it's a little bit more bid, but I think there's games like Gollum, which I like watch those. And I like, I watch playthroughs for those type of games. And I'm like, I, 
I don't even know where you started to think about making this game, right? The, like the decisions that happened here are like, and I'm sure the equivalent is like a really horrible website you two have seen. Like, why did you even think to make this, right? Let alone actually spend the money and time to actually build this out this way. Um, so yeah, it, it, but yeah, it can be rough. It can be rough to like see how the sausage is made. Um, but I also think like it kind of makes those like really impressive like games it may it makes them stand out even more even more which i'm sure like i'm sure when you two see like a really a, fl- a website that's doing something really crazy i'm sure it probably does the same thing for you right it's like oh wow like, yeah that? exactly like it, it you know it enhances like if somebody's doing something really good you're like wow that's amazing like how did they do that but right. if it sucks it's like man what are they doing right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like what what are some gameplay mechanics y'all have seen like recently that kind of stood out or um so recently like i've been playing a lot of street fighter 6 like mm-hmm. trying to get back into the competitive scene and like yeah, there's always a mix of like like how do you make combos like how do you make the fighting game system like intuitive and easy but also complex at the same time mm-hmm. and what they've what capcom has done recently with street fighter 6 i really like their design decisions of like how you manage your meter and how you manage life like like you like uh i think maybe in street fighter 5 or maybe i know for sure in street fighter 4 big body characters like zangief and, and smaller characters like Kami and Chun Li, they had different life, right? So like, Zangief had let's say ten thousand health, and like Kami mm-hmm. had nine fifty or whatever, like, and that that fifty damage like makes a difference. Like mm-hmm. it's it, like in the long in the meta, like as the game progresses, it makes a difference. Well, in Street Fighter Six, the decision to universally give everybody the same health uh, feels better, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Like. Yeah. It, it it feels I don't have to worry about an extra 50 damage because mm-hmm. everybody across the board has the same amount of health mm-hmm. and then giving everybody access to things like a parry and um, and introducing things like perfect parrying uh, it just gives a simple mechanic depth overall across the board and uh, I don't know to me it's it feels like a breath of fresh air it feels really good it feels really good yeah and I, I guess to piggyback off that right like i'm i'm trash at fighting games like honestly i love them i'm just not good at them and so uh, so i was already excited after playing the street fighter 6 demo uh, because they had the open world mode and um what i really enjoyed is like how it's slowly teaching me kind of advanced gameplay stuff that i'm like way above my head right i'm not yeah. i don't do anything with frames or anything like that but it's just small like things even the point i'm at i think i just uh, met chen li and um like they're trying to i guess they're trying to teach me basically there's a good time to hit somebody to stun them and like they flash white at a specific time and so like after they do a move i'll hit them and then at that time if i hit them they all they're all of a sudden stunned and just kind of starting to put that together with like oh okay and then if i combo that if i put that with a throw oh okay i lit up this uh mp this computer right now yeah. granted terrence would destroy me with his hand behind his back if we played right <laughs> but at least I, I was able to give the computer a, a, some work and and that was it, it yeah. was fun right so i like feel at least for a little while i was good at a fighting game yeah you know what like that uh and i'm uh, is that brings another point to my mind and i'm, I'm going to mention it and i'm going to keep this point brief that makes me feel good mm-hmm. because like don't get me wrong like the order the earlier fighting games like as true as true as they are an arcade perfect and stuff like that like for the hardcore scene what they've done with street fighter 6 and i'm not trying to make this podcast just about street fighter 6 it's just a game that i've recently been playing a lot of uh they've they've made they've made a really solid experience for beginners and novices that want to be that want to just enjoy a game that they they can sit down and play Mm -hmm. right and the fact that that i'm hearing this from Mm -hmm. from somebody that i've never talked fighting games before but Mm -hmm. that you're talking about it in a sense of like hey they flash white that means i can do this Mm -hmm. so 
the like the neurons firing off in your brain is like, oh my gosh, he gets it. Like, he, you know, he, like in my brain, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, you can do this and you can do that, but you're you're just simply just like bread, peanut butter, jelly, put it together. Boom. Like, but me, I'm over here like, all right, salami, mm-hmm. uh, ham, fry this up, add an egg, do this, you know, toast, toast the bread, add the butter. Like, mm-hmm. I'm I'm over here, you know, a hundred steps ahead, and you're just like. A, B, C, boom, done. Yeah, right. And the fact that you're getting that that concept with uh, a a single player mode that they've made or they introduce mm-hmm. into a, a fighting game is 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 really great. It's mm-hmm. it's awesome, mm-hmm. and um, it, it reminded me of another point where I was uh, I was playing offline with somebody, and they were they were configuring their controllers, the, their 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 the control scheme to add uh to turn on accessibility i don't know if you've noticed this but uh in this game versus other games uh in order to do certain special moves uh they've added accessibility where instead of inputting this like complex motion Mm -hmm. you can just uh hold down one button and do and then press another button Mm -hmm. and it'll it'll give you access to those to those tools yeah. And I didn't consider it until now where it's like, okay, what if somebody had a condition where they, it, it yeah. makes it difficult for them to input complex motions? Like, how do you simplify that for people to, uh, to make it accessible for everybody? And uh, just seeing that in use, like in person was like, wow, like I never considered that like, like as, as a, as a gamer and I'm, and I'm, I feel like we're going into a, an accessibility route. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, uh, as as somebody who's able, right, uh, for the most part, like I don't consider those options when I'm when I'm gaming. I just fire it up and I'm and I'm and I'm off to the races. But do you guys ever consider accessibility features in games? Uh, one as a developer and two as a as just a gamer in general. Uh, I haven't thought about it too much, you know, because a lot of times if it doesn't affect you, you don't really consider it. But yeah. I know. You know, it's good to think about that, so people right. are, are able to. But I know, I know, Jonathan. I know you have to definitely consider it, considering uh, you know you're actually releasing games to the public. Yeah, yeah, right. And and I think it's a conversation that keep that's growing more as people like just you know just as game developers like start to really as game developers start to change and become more diverse like i think it makes for people who have more diverse perspectives right um you know i haven't been around like i've i've you know i've met blind gamers right i've met people who don't really have much vision and they you know who had to who you know small small things like you know just having a game increase the text size can be um super valuable right they might be legally blind and can't drive but um just small conveniences make it possible for them to play a game they really love or um for for to actually this year they won an award at the game awards for um mm-hmm. their whole single player has like a sign like they signed the whole um basically the whole storyline like there's like a little person that pops up in the corner and they like sign kind of like a a live um version of uh you know the story points and stuff right so somebody who who um uh is uh who is deaf they can follow along with what the plot details are and everything right and um um and then you know probably the the most significant thing i think i saw was like I've, i've gone to a few during GDC, Microsoft holds a lot of kind of accessibility parties. And um, they put on this video one day uh, kind of discussing this uh, guy who uh, he didn't have, I he didn't have much motion in his hands. And he was kind of, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say he's quadriplegic, but he just didn't have much motion in his body. And so he had an adaptive, adaptive controller. Um, and you know, just seeing this person who like really couldn't move his hand much, but I think he could move his fingers, being able to play a game um, because they have these special controllers for him, like that type of stuff, like it really touched my heart because like, you know, kind of you being able to have control of controllers and, you know, feeling like I was born with a controller in my hand. Um, you know, there's so many things I can do with games, but um uh, it, I think it really is important. I think the thing I think we all love about video games is kind of we for a second we get to be someone who's not us. And I think that even goes to if you're uh, 
kind of if you have accessibility issues with your body, I'm sure, you know, being able to run around Hyrule and fly with a, a hang glider or, you know, being able to be Chun Li and, you know, flip upside down and do a spin kick at people, right? Like how how far removed is that from your real life experience, right? And uh, so, yeah, I, I think accessibility is super important. And definitely I, I, one of the things I'm excited about at Alchemy mm -hmm. Labs is they do a lot of work in kind of the accessibility phase for games. And um, I'm really excited to learn and kind of do more work in that space because, um, you know, I do, I believe games are for everybody truly. And awesome. So, yeah. So, you know, uh, recently uh, they had the Nintendo Direct show and they released, uh, they, they have a game with Peach as the main star. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's pretty interesting because normally, you know, it's the guy saving a girl. So mm -hmm. I wonder what kind of spin they're going to take on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, have y'all like really talked to women who are into games and do they feel like underrepresented, you know, like there's not mm. that many. Uh, I, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go, go. You can feel free to go for sure. I mean, like. I've had I've had I have a girlfriend who's a gamer, mm -hmm. um, not hardcore in the sense of like, you know, competitive. Um, as far as representation. I don't think she ever complains that Kirby isn't a girl. I mean, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't really have any experience in this in this area as far as like representation and. Do you mean like as a as female protagonists, or yeah, like, yeah, like more so like protagonists? They they're able to see somebody that kind of represents them uh, as they play the game. Hmm. So, you know, ma imagine if it was reversed, like you turned on Street Fighter and, you know, 95% of the characters were female or, you know what I mean? Uh, you And it's, it's like that in game after game after game where almost all the characters are females. Like, would that drive you off or do you think you would still be like as into gaming? Uh, I mean, for me, like like uh samus is a girl right i'm not complaining that samus, samus has always been a girl to me like if right. they they change him if they change the main character of metroid to be a guy like i would be con i would be confused <laughs> okay why like but you know if they want to go in a different direction if it's a if it's a different universe or what have you like okay sure like i have no the gender of a character doesn't really matter to me. Like, if the story the story is good, like if God if if Kratos was suddenly a girl, it would be weird. Like, I would, I'd be I'd have questions. <laughs> but if, if 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 they can make the story make sense, if the if it again if it's if it's an alternate universe or what have you, like, okay, you know, by all means, you know, enjoy it. Uh, but I just feel like at the end of the day, what what matters most is to have a solid story like is the story compelling like does it pull me in does it make me want to sit down and play more because that's what i play the games for like like that's what mean that's what matters most to me and i'm not trying to hog the mic uh but to me like it comes down to the characters and the storytelling the, the the whole reason of me sitting down and enjoy and 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 turning on this game is to is to experience is to have an experience is to experience something like the accuse the the yakuza games like i'm i'm sitting down and i'm experiencing something the the tears of the kingdom like i gotta save the princess mm -hmm. like kirby i gotta eat stuff mm -hmm. like <laughs> you know like right. for me that's why I play the games. Like I'm, I'm, I want to experience something, and if the experience is worth it, like the, then you know, I'm all for it. Like that's that's my two cents. What do you guys think? Hey, hey how's it going, Lou? But uh, yeah, um, I think you know we do need like more representation, but I don't like forced representation. Like a lot of people are getting mad because Final Fantasy 16 was you know most almost all white, but that's you know it's medieval, kind of like medieval Europe. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like we should force diversity, but it should be in there where, you know, it makes sense. So other people can kind of, you know, honestly, you kind of feel something when somebody looks more like you or you can yeah. identify with that character to an extent. Mm -hmm. yeah. but what do you yeah. think, Jonathan? Yeah, no, I, I think um, 
I, I I agree with both of you, right? And I think I I know quite a few right f- female gamers from my little sister to or uh, women gamers from my little sister to uh, my girlfriend. She's again, she's not a hardcore one. She plays like Among Us and uh, Clash Royale, so more mobile games and stuff. And she'll play stuff on my Switch with me every once in a while. Um, uh, but yeah, it's um, I think. I think it's I think it first of all I think it's a hard conversation for us to have as as men right it's a little different our perspective but right. uh, mm-hmm. uh, but I do think uh, I've I've heard I feel like what I've generally heard is like representation for women in games is getting better but there's you know it's always a, there's still a long way to go right um, I think you know games like Peach are a good start. Um, but you know, I, I think it is important to keep in mind, you know, the the likes of Samus, right? Like Samus was like super mind blowing at the time. Like I yeah. think I think the whole point of Metroid, like I don't think you find out Samus is a woman until the, the final, right before the final credits roll, right? Mm-hmm. And how uh, pivotal, right? And how big that was at the time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, um, and you know, going from Mario having saved Princess Peach forever to the Mario movie comes out, and Princess Peach is kind of her own doing her own thing for the movie and she's like basically an action star herself and now she gets her own movie that's awesome um but yeah i, I think i think that i have heard from women like you know there's definitely a, a hope for more representation and i guess kind of more i think it's been less i've heard like they want more representation it's kind of like less sexualization right like yeah. i think you know back in the gate back in the day uh fighting games um, I think it was like impossible to have like a female character who wasn't half naked, like in most of the games, right? Yeah. Um, and then just over time, I think you know, like you now you have so many characters, and some of them can be more lewd, right? Like I love Melina in Mortal Kombat; she's one of my favorites. She's always been, she's always been kind of more risque. But then you have other characters who are more like suited and booted, and they are more like they have a full outfit and a, a full style to them so right. um, so yeah i think i think it's kind of it's kind of a nuanced topic right but i i think it's it's important and i i think i have heard that a lot of women do feel more represented now than they used to yeah i think uh you know just being able to have that visual identity of seeing somebody that yeah. is what you represent you know it yeah. kind of draws you in a little more that looks yeah. like you yeah. Yeah. yeah i think we kind of take it for granted to a certain extent because mm-hmm. we're men and it's like mm-hmm. almost like the accessibility discussion we just right had. right right yeah yeah yeah, you know, yeah. Like the controller fits right in our hand and we, we're good to go but somebody yeah. might not have that so it's like yeah. we're not thinking about it yeah but you, you know what though uh like something that comes to mind it's not it's a little derivative of of the whole like representation idea so like when uh i don't know if you guys have follow if you guys keep up with comics and things like that but like when miles morales first came out mm-hmm. they were like oh spider-man's black now mm-hmm. like you know you know uh there was a there was a lot of there was some backlash behind that yeah and um i don't know all the deep lore i'm not going to speak on it just because you know i i don't know the ins and outs i just know that there was some pushback on it right uh the same as when you know um what is it they when silk they they released silk spider and she's asian and then you know so you have spider gwen and and it was mm-hmm. just like they all these derivatives of of of, of spider-man uh but then something that comes to mind is like when when stan lee was talking about spider-man it's like why does he wear a mask it's like well because the mask is represent that anybody can be Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. like in, in, it's not the person under the mask. It's the person, the person doing the actions. And I'm, yeah. I'm butchering the quote. And I, and I, mm-hmm. I apologize to the, to like uh, mm-hmm. Stan Lee, but like, uh, what comes to mind so much is like, Samus is, was badass, mm-hmm. you know, from one and two until the end of two, and well, not until the end of two, but you don't see the person behind the mask. You just mm-hmm. You're turning into a morph ball. You're shooting right. aliens. You're 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 defeating Chozo. You're doing all this badass stuff, and then at the end, you're like, "Oh my gosh, I'm a I'm a girl." Mm-hmm. Like, but the, but that doesn't take away from the fact that Samus has a ton of games. Mm-hmm. Metroid Dread was a great game. Mm-hmm. The, I'm sure Metroid Prime Four, when it drops, it's gonna be it's gonna do gangbusters. Right. Um, like the. The, the 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 point the point I'm trying to make is like, I think when you have a strong character, regardless of whether they're black, white, Asian, blue, brown, 
Um, it's just the fact that they are a strong character and they have core values that they stand up for, mm -hmm. and that and and that's what should that's that's what your game should stand on. Right. Uh, the, the 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 fact that they are you know their their race or their their gender uh, uh, should should come second, but I think that that you, the representation does matter like like you said to a, to a degree like everybody should feel like they should connect they can connect with a character um at, at one point or another mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i think like even uh the creator character uh options in a lot of games are getting better like yeah you know before <laughs> there was no mm -hmm. black options now they give you like mm -hmm. an avro and some dreads or something yeah <laughs> right. street fighter 6 does really good with that mm -hmm. they, they have they've got so much character customization mm -hmm. they, that it, it's ridiculous like you've got afros you've got Obviously, bald people like mm -hmm. so many different eye options. I think Dark Souls, not Dark Souls, but From Software does that. Elden mm -hmm. Ring has like a crazy customization, mm -hmm. make your character look like a bunch of different things. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, it's so deep now. You can spend hours in mm -hmm. in, in, a, in create a character, just dressing up your character as whatever. John, do you find like uh, game developers are kind of using like these creator character things to develop the characters versus like trying to custom? create them from scratch or how, how's uh, a lot of these characters being created nowadays? Yeah, I think it kind of, it. I think it depends on, it depends on the kind of game, right? Like I think, um, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big Saints Row fan. And so a game like Saints Row, where it's kind of always been about you being this character kind of inserted into this larger world and basically taking over all everybody else's territory that's a whole different kind of motivation versus you know i think about uh, you know tomb raider right you know where lara, lara croft is a very specific person right who's adventurous and she's kind of dangerous her thing right and she also finds herself in these really perilous positions um i think uh, i think it all kind of comes down to like really what you want people to feel when they play your game and um and even to, you know, kind of similar to your point, Terrence, I think uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, who uh, made Mario and Zelda, um, I think they always they asked him back in the day, like, how come uh, Link doesn't speak? And that was his statement at the time, too. He's like, Link is you, right? Like, Link is not his own character. Like, and even though Link has qualities, like, really, when it comes down to it, like, all the adventures you go on, all the stories you have, all the things you accomplish, all the monsters you beat, that was you doing it, right? Link is a stand-in for who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, yeah, I think it kind of comes down to what you want from a character, right? Like, you know, um, I think it's Clyde in Final Fantasy 16. I think that's that's the main dude's name, right? Mm -hmm, it, like, yeah. So I think I'm, I'm excited to see his story, right? Like, and, you know, the demo kind of set up, like, who he is and what he is in the world and his relationship with his family and all that stuff. And I'm excited to go on his journey versus like Saints Row where it's like, oh, I'm about to take over the city. This is me, right? Um, and so I think it's kind of, it, it depends on the, uh, usually for in when you're working on a game, it kind of, that that's like a conversation, like who is the player? Like that's something you talk about at the very beginning. So like uh, when typically developing these games, like do y'all completely like plan everything out before you start coding or is it kind of like, you know, plan some out, start coding, plan some more out, start, you know, do more coding? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a lot more the second one because I think um, because I think you can have a million ideas and plans and ideas of how something should work, but you really don't know how it works until you kind of, you know, get some of it together and then you play it and it's like oh this doesn't feel right or um, this feels really good like we should do more of this or um you know you're kind of exploring what the game is what the character is what the gameplay should be and just kind of trying to marry it together to try to make the best experience possible so a lot of times it's like we do a little we plan a little we what well, we do a little we see what works we plan a little more and then just kind of trying to flesh that out. And that's what play testing and all that stuff's for, right? Just kind of helping us figure out, okay, is this is this conveying what we want it to? And if not, then we have to go back to the drawing board. Okay, what well, what are we getting wrong? You know. How, how do you uh do you guys well as a as a developer, how do you go about playtesting uh a game like you don't personally play test your own games or is it somebody who's just like a, a dedicated play tester? 
Right. So I guess there's three different t- kind of testing. So like for me, right, like I, I, when I program games, like I'll, I at least do like a basic, like this works as intended as the designer explained it right. to me test, right? Like, so that's like the first level testing. Then we have like a QA team and they go and I would almost say they bang on the experience or the game and kind of, um, right. They kind of check the game for any issues and, uh, you know, whatever technical thoughts or, you know, there's this really weird bug where if I push the attack button, I pause and then I start um, start the game like there's an infinite attack that's happening and like the character never has to like their stamina meter doesn't go down or stuff Mm -hmm. like that. Right. Just like little areas where kind of the game systems clash is what I think of. And playtesting is kind of like the next level where it's like, okay, if we put this in front of a fan, basically, right, or somebody who isn't working on the game to make it, what what is their experience? Like, are they, uh, do they get what this button combo does? Like, we explained, maybe we explained that you could wall jump, and maybe there's, like, whenever you could wall jump, there's red paint on the walls. And, like, maybe we tell them that at the beginning, they run through the level and they get to a place where there's red paint on the walls. And they're like, I don't know how to get up. Right. Then we did a job. We missed, we missed something somewhere. Mm-hmm. Right. We didn't complete, we didn't quick correctly convey, Oh, this is how you kind of maneuver through the level. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the three different levels. And that play testing is more of like, okay, this is what we set out to do. Do people get it when they actually get the controller in there? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then do you, do you, um, as I guess, as a dev, it, does it ever come across your mind like, oh, let me watch somebody? Let's like, let's uh, let, let, would you? Mm, let me think about what I'm trying to say before I say it. I think I know what you're um, about to say. But yeah. Do you ever watch like a live stream of a game that you've developed, and then see how somebody like that, that's completely fresh and green to the game uh, interact? And and they're usually like almost like waiting with bated breath. Like Oof. I hope that they get this. Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean. Like, like right. okay, this there's this thing here. I hope that they notice this All this right. thing. Right. Yeah. And, and personally, I think that's to me that's the real test, right? Like, because if I tell you if I tell you exactly how to play my game, and then you go and you do exactly what I said, like did I, did you actually learn how to play my game, or did you just do what I said over and over again? Right. Um, and I think that's different versus like, uh, I, you know, I love putting a game in front of somebody and, you know, kind of explaining something to them and then mm-hmm. understanding that like they're able to kind of see and I would, um, I call it reading, but they're able to read the environment and then make the correct decision based off the stuff I've already taught them. Um, yeah. Cause I, to me, that's when, that's really when, you know, fighting games are actually a great example of that, right? Like fighting games are all about teaching you lots of pieces, but the real magic happens when you have that, those people who are like really high level who are like, oh, I can do A, B, C, Y, and D. And kind of like your, your, uh, your uh, analogy about being in the kitchen, right? They can cook up uh, the first class meal based off all the individual pieces. Right. Um, And so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, I love to watch people do live gameplay. I think that's the most fun. I think that's the way you learn the most. I think it's um, how you can really understand if your game conveys the stuff you want it to. Um, it, it's also a way to like tell if somebody's uh, actually kind of getting into, we call it a flow state in games. Like, And I'm sure we've, like all of us have probably played a game at a point where it's like, I almost think about the times where I feel like I melded with my controller for a second, right? Like it's not, I'm not, it's almost like it's second nature, the stuff I do. Like the times where I get excited when I did something on a game, right? Like right. I go up for a dunk and I dunk on a character. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm too good. I'm too good. To <laughs> me, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the goal. And being able to see somebody fall into that flow state where it's almost second nature, like that's that's where the magic happens to me. That's where a game really that's almost to me where you as a player have connected the most with the game. And when it when you understand a game enough that you're able to really make them like make the most of everything you understand about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like have have you met like any of the big names in the industry, like Miyamoto, Kojima? Yeah. I've, 
I've seen so I've seen Kojima do a talk. I think maybe twice, but so I, no, I've never met him. I've seen Kojima. Uh, I I like to joke sometimes. I've seen Miyamoto's entourage, and that's kind of every Miyamoto story I've ever heard. Is like you'll see you'll hear about a bunch of dudes in black suits like mobbing a dude and just kind of walking down the hallway. And it's like, oh, that was Shigeru Miyamoto, right? Like it's he was in somewhere in that mass of dudes in black suits was Mr. Nintendo. Um, uh, I think probably the most famous game developer I met was Tim Schafer, who made um, Psychonauts, Grim Fandango. Um, oh, man, I'm trying to think what it was more. I mean, Psychonauts 2. His studio, Double Fine, has made a bunch of games. Mm, yeah. um, so he's probably the most popular, like, kind of game developer I met and, like, one of my game dev heroes. So that was really awesome. Um, I've met people who have worked at like quite a few different studios, but yeah, Tim Schafer was like my big, like, oh man, that was, it was cool to meet, you know, uh, somebody who looked up to reading gaming magazines growing up. So we all are able to have like conversations about the gaming industry and gameplay mechanics and things of that nature, or was it more like a quick meet? It was a, it was a quick meet. It was like a conference. So I think he was on his way to like talk to GameSpot or something, but, um, I just, I caught him in the hallway and I don't even... It's wild because I don't even remember fully seeing him. I felt like I saw him out the corner of my eye and I was like, hey, Tim. And I was like, can I have a picture? And he took a picture with me. And I remember freezing up and basically being starstruck. And um, uh, he took a picture with me and he's like, so, hey, hi, I'm Tim. And I was like, I'm Jonathan. And he was like, cool, John. Uh, and I was just I was just frozen, basically. Right. And he's like, well, John, I got to go got to go have an interview and uh yeah but I, I was super starstruck and i'm super embarrassed now because like i would have loved to actually talk about him and told him like uh your games were pivotal to me right you inspired me i, I made games because of you uh but i all of that was in my throat i didn't have <laughs> um but yeah yeah it was fun it was fun to meet him have you had the opposite experience like a fan came up to you and said hey man i played your game i love it I haven't had that, but I have, like, I used to write on Quora a lot, like, just kind of about game development. And sometimes I would, I remember one time I posted about a game I made, um, and I, I did have, like, or a couple of times I posted about games I made, and I might just talk about a game I made. And um, I had people go, oh, I remember playing, playing this game when I was a kid, which that was exciting. Or um, I made, like, this really small indie game, and this guy, like, sent me this really... Uh, really kind message about how like this this game we made inspired him to write a short story and that, like that was just that was a really cool thing to hear that like you know your work was able to inspire somebody to create something um, so yeah mm -hmm. yeah I think that is pretty cool like somebody so inspired by a work they're a fan they love the universe and yeah. you know they're making their own little stories mm -hmm. absolutely I wish I had that creative vibe, but uh, I'm more like a mechanical thinker. That's fair. I get it. And I think uh, kind of like you asked it, Ter uh, Terrence earlier about like wanting to work in game development. And I I quite like I feel like the people who work on games are obsessed. Like I, I, I feel like I'm like it's less because I sometimes I hate game development. If I'm honest, it's a lot of work and can be really tedious. It's a lot of really a lot of fine-tuning small details that no one notices if they don't work on games um but i also like feel compelled sometimes to make games like i wouldn't know what to do with myself if i wasn't making a game and um and and so i think that's kind of like i i think you're totally right like if you don't have that pool i would stay away because it can be a lot of work even as somebody who's obsessed who wouldn't choose to do anything else with my life Sometimes I'm like, man, making games is why? Why do I do this to myself? Why do I keep doing this to myself? Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're all different, different strokes, right? And games still need websites. So um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You I got, got a question it. for you, Terrence. Like you knowing like what programming is like and seeing how intense game development is, does that make you like reevaluate how you talk about games online and you know, like oh, you're yeah. on a message board, a lot of people are like, oh man, this game is buggy. These devs oh. are so lazy. You yeah, know? all the time. <laughs> yeah, I had a, um, I had a very passionate, I'll call it passionate, moment <laughs> discussion with somebody, uh, where they were saying like, just really, just like, what's taking so long? Just release Tekken Eight now, and I'm like, <laughs> dude, like, 
you don't understand how much time like it takes to not just release a game like you can't just copy and paste and release a game because it'll flop like people will complain that it's just a copy and paste oh it's nothing new blah 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 but in reality like we think you know creating a react app can be difficult and 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 and, you know managing state and communicating with different mfps and all this other stuff you get into game dev dev, and it's like all right we want to make a character we want to give them all these moves. We have right. mocap. You have to, I don't know, import the physics. mocap and physics, right? Mm-hmm. You have to get all that right. Then, then once you get all that right, then you have to introduce a battle system. Right. Then you have to make sure it's fair for all the characters that you've introduced. Right. Yeah. Then you got to hope that a character that you introduced isn't busted on day one, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> and then it, and then you have to give it to players and have them play the game. Mm-hmm. And then you have to go back and and take the feedback that you got. You see, you see where I'm going. Like, mm-hmm. hey, there's so much you can't just take the game, release it, because then you'll just be like, oh, MK Mortal Kombat One just just it's just Mortal Kombat 11.5, mm-hmm. nothing, right. nothing new. <laughs> and it's like you guys, you guys don't understand like how yeah. much gray hair goes into yeah. making a game. Like, right. like when it takes years to develop, like it takes it takes time and budget. Yeah, right. And it takes time. <laughs> Especially to de- develop Smash Brothers Sakurai, or I think that's the uh, yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. Sakurai. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Sakurai. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, he, he was getting sick because he was working so hard. Like, yeah. And fighting games are actually like, I think two games. Like, I don't. I think I'd be cool if I never touched like ever making. Like, I think fighting games and MMOs, like, because they're just yeah. so so many points of failure and like fighting games like you know uh, to, to your point right like it's not just it's making a character who has 50 moves and 50 moves that feel right and 50 moves that they can be composed into one cohesive style and then it's making one character with 50 moves that can be one cohesive style that can fight 29 other people that have yep. their own 50 yep. moves and cohesive styles yep. and making sure when i like that you know the the collision boxes hit correctly and it's 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 wild yeah fighting games are ha- it's outrageous how much work goes into a fighting game yeah you can't really change too much if people go ballistic like yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. it's funny because like and again not to make this about street fighter six i'm sorry <laughs> but like uh there are people asking for nerfs on certain characters and it's been the game dropped june 2nd it's going on three weeks now, and people are already asking. All oh, they're on, they're on Twitter. Oh, nerf this character. This character is broken. You know, do this, do that. Don't get me wrong. Like I've, I've had my salty moments on 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 Discord, and I'm just like, you know, I don't, I don't like this character. This is frustrating. Blah blah blah. But the meta hasn't been figured out. Like I would let, I would let, like wait until. Like wait six months. Wait until the first like the first real competitive tournament is in, is is out, and wait for top eight. Like then you'll know when a character is busted or not. Because if seven out of the top eight characters are all one character, it's a problem. Yeah. Like yeah. like right. that. That's when you know you have a problem. Right. Like, but but before then, if you nerf too early and too often, it just dilutes the game. Right. It 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 makes the game boring like right and i think that's where that's where you as as a game dev and i'm sorry for holding the mic for so long like as a game dev you have to be able to manage who do you listen to your consumer or your competitive scene like how do you how do you balance this right enough to make it fun for everybody you know like you have 30 if you have 30 or 40 characters and People are only playing six. You got a pre- you got a problem. Right. And you have to, you have to, but you have to make it so that you don't throw the six characters that everybody's playing in the trash right. and make everybody else viable. Right. It, it's tough. It's a tough balancing act. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think people kind of people don't always remember. Like people don't always appreciate how how much trying to keep a community happy, right? And how challenging that is, right? Like, because again, yeah, to your point, right? It's that like, okay, what is the right move to make sure the game stays alive versus like, 
who who are true fans, right? Who are day ones that we want to make sure we don't turn away because they spend the most time with our game. And then how do we make sure we bring in new people? It's just a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, and unfortunately, I think I got to bounce really quick, but uh, no but problem. it was dope to talk to both of you tonight. And, yeah, uh, man. Yeah, Appreciate course. you stopping by, man. Uh, definitely stop by anytime. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I look forward to catching up with you later. All right, right man. You have a good one. Yeah, you too. Bye bye. So yeah, Terrence, what, what what did you think about that Nintendo Direct? Like, do you feel like they were showcasing games you're interested in, or is it more like uh, more of the same? Um, well, you know, they had their they had their single player. I mean, they had their uh, indie dev games, right? I think they had a, a free to play game that was online or something. Mm-hmm. I forgot the name of it. I think it started with a P or something. Um. But I wasn't too interested in that. I was surprised to see Batman on Arkham come to the Switch. But I mean, they're releasing it all in one collection, and I think it's actually a pretty that's actually a pretty cool idea mm. to uh, to bring back like an older game and make it portable um, on the Switch. As long as it's not the PC port, because I heard bad things about it. I'm, I'm playing through it right now, but I, I I hear that there's there's a couple of funky things going on with the PC port. Mm. Um. But besides the indie stuff, I did like Star Ocean 2 getting announced. Yeah. Um, what do you think about Pop- Super Mario Wonder? It's, it's a Mario game. Uh, I think my girlfriend will like it. Um, I haven't played a Super Mario game s- since Odyssey. So, oh, okay. like, the 2D Mario stuff... There's got to be a market for it. I guess it's it's out there. Um, I'm more excited for the Super Mario RPG that coming back than I am a new 2D Mario. Um, you but... kind of grew up on the 3D Mario's, right? You you never got into like the Super Mario World on Super no. Nintendo. I mean, I I've I had so I had an N64 and I had friends who had the SNES and Genesis and stuff, mm-hmm. and they had. Super Mario World and super, like the the collection, you know the um, um, on on SNES, and I played it, but I never beat it. I never like sat down and actually beat a Super Mario game. The only Super Mario game I think I've beat um, is well, can I even say I beat it? I think a friend of mine beat it for me. It was a mm-hmm. uh, Super Mario sixty four, but I I I haven't like one hundred and twenty started it though. The 2D looks cool. I'm actually excited for it. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious what they're gonna do with the Wonder stuff, like the the alternate world that you go into, and like Mario can like stretch and he can turn into a. Well, I think Kevin froze. Um, he can he can stretch. I think he can turn into an elephant. Like, I think it'll be pretty cool. Like to see what they do with um, with the that wonder side of things. Hold on. Let me see if I can get Kevin back. Oh, you're lagging. Kevin, you there? Kevin. Hello. No. That's not. Kevin? Oh, 
Oh, all right. Okay, there we go. Can you yeah. Hear me? All right, we're back. <laughs> yeah, like, it was spazzing for a second. Yeah, yeah, that was weird. But yeah. um, yeah, we're talking about. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, we we're talking about what Super Mario. Yeah, the one Super Mario Wonder. I was just saying that, like, um, I mean, it looks cool. Like, I want to see what they do with the the whole Wonder side of things, right? Because don't you go into a a flower or something? Or a, a, a well, I guess they call it wonders, and then you it's like an alternate. It's the same level, but like a flip side version of that level. Mm. And then like I think they demoed he, he, that he can stretch now, and he can transform into different stuff, like an elephant, and um, a, s some other stuff. I think that I think that'd be cool. See what they do with that. It's a, it'll be an interesting spin on on Mario. I think, I think it's more for you know like older fans like who grew up on like the original 2d games uh because like lou uh he, he's looking forward to it but i if, if you grew up on the 3d ones i, I don't know if it necessarily appealed to somebody who grew up on the 3d ones right i think it looks pretty good though but like you mentioned the super mario rpg i'm definitely looking forward to that mm -hmm. did you play the original super nintendo I didn't, but you know, I've I've heard good things about it, so it can't be that bad. It's got to be. It's got to be good. To, you get to come in, come into it fresh, so that'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like I'll I'll wait I'll wait and see what they say about it. You know, um, I'm I'm I mean I doubt it'll be bad. I doubt it'll be bad. I'm not I'm not I'm not putting that out there, but I'm I'm just gonna wait and see what what uh what the consensus is they're talking about a rumor of like a chrono trigger remake like a hd 2d I mean, maybe I maybe I don't if they remake it they need to like remake it like how they did seven i don't, I don't want, want like a little oh you want to pull from the ground up remake, remake yeah you, you know what i heard was uh the they're asking to possibly remake final fantasy six they need to they need to hold their horses, finish nine, finish eight, and then go back and do whatever other Final Fantasies they want to do. Like I feel like if they're gonna take that route, like do the route of of uh Resident Evil, right? Resident Evil has done the popular route where it's like, all right, RE2 is super popular. Let's let's release that remake. All right, boom. Then they did RE3, which was like a rush job, which I heard it wasn't that good. Um, and then RE4, they took their time with, and that's a great game, right? It, it feels good. If they're going to remake Final Fantasies, I think 7, 8, and 9 is where it's at. I know there's one on the SNES that's, like, super good or whatever, but I think 7, 8, and 9 is their moneymaker. That's just my opinion. I think if they're going to remake Final Fantasies, 7, 8, and 9 are going to be the most notable as far as like demographics is concerned right yeah yeah I mean, I, but after seven is really when the series like really blew up like yeah it, it was pretty big on uh part six was pretty big chrono trigger was big but seven is like when it became like you know like a metal gear solid like a yeah. franchise builder yeah. type of yep i think they're uh releasing the metal gear solid collection on switch as well yeah but that's just more of the not more the same, but that's just the it's just a uh, port of the, th the 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 three games, right? It's nothing new. Final Fantasy VII was was awesome. Yeah, that, did you did you think the remake did it justice though? I think he froze up here. Who what? Uh, did you did you feel like Final Fantasy VII remake uh, did the original justice? Um. I feel like they did a really good job, honestly, with the remake. They they brought it to life where where a lot of the parts of the game that just felt like not eh, but they felt more like on PS One, like for the like getting into Don Quixote's uh, club or whatever, right? Okay, you go you. You dress as a girl, you you do it. like they brought that whole scene to life. Like Cloud doesn't want to do it. He's like, oh, why do I have to do this? Like that whole 
like in oh how do I say it? In seven, eight, nine, you have you 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 are like the narrator. You you voice these characters. You give them inflections. Mm -hmm. You give them personality. You give so them maybe more alive to you, kind of like more immersive. Yes, it's, it's more yeah. Like in in the remakes, they're more immersive. They take away that 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 having to emote and think of of or not think, but it takes away that. Oh, they it, it 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 takes away that less imagination and more yeah, it, it's, it's 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 you're you're pulling these characters out of my head and and bringing them and bringing them to life in front of me, like mm. the fact that 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 Sephiroth feels like he's just messing with Cloud throughout this whole adventure, like like you you get glimpses of that in the in the PlayStation One. But I feel like it's li it's very limited, not by just the platform, but by the by the technology at the time, right? But now you've got, I mean, look, just look at the game. I could talk about this for for a long time, but like, but just look at the game, right? The game itself is only in Midgar. You, I, you, you don't even realize that you spent fifty some odd hours, sixty some odd hours in just one one area. Right? How, how long was that in the original game? Like twenty hours? It was. Or it, was 10? it was. Yeah, I want to say no more than ten to twenty hours, possibly fifteen, probably. It's the sweet spot. But like, once you're done with that area, you're done. You get you get your your ship, and then you're out, and you're out into the open world, right? Yeah. But you spent all this time in one area, right? You the seventh heaven comes to life. Uh. I only know about Second Life. Lord help me. <laughs> that's old school. That's real old school. That's real. Is that still a thing? Uh, I think so. It probably is. Probably I mean, is. But with VR, it's probably it probably is. Wasn't that uh, like a PlayStation Home kind of like a uh, like an MMO RPG, but more social? Second Life, I think, was still a thing. Virtual worlds. Wow. Kind of like the metaverse before the metaverse. Before the metaverse, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, sorry, what was I saying? Like, I just feel like, I feel like they did it justice. I feel like the fact that they take the time to not just, not just take what they've already made, add a, add a, a nice, a nice coat of paint on it, and then boom, you've got your, you've got Final Fantasy remake. They actually take the time to, to say, okay, what what do we have, and how do we make it better, and 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 then you have to write each character, you've got to voice the characters, you've got to, there's so much things that that make it just come to life, that I probably I'm, I'm probably ready for another playthrough. Uh, I think I think that's what it is. I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready for another playthrough, Kevin. <laughs> about to drop another uh, I'm gonna drop another hours. another 80 hours into into it i'll play it on hard mode though yeah. okay yeah. And so you know, like, said, programming yeah. and gaming go together did is that what got you to wanting to be a programmer like hey i want to make my own game yeah yeah i think so uh, you know growing up i played ps1 n64 snes a bunch of different games i was a really obsessive gamer <laughs> um and and i just liked you know I, I would i would pause like cartoons and i would pause video games and i would i would put a piece of paper onto the crt tv and like press it onto the tv to try and make the image shine through and i would try to draw mm -hmm. over i would try to trace over the the characters and try to draw that way i wanted to be an artist but I, you know art wasn't really my thing um and I, I eventually stumbled onto computers and programming and stuff. So I guess you know, gaming was my was the uh, the catalyst to to that whole to where I am now. Um, but I don't think. Do you need to game? Like, is it is it a requirement or a prerequisite? It's a nice to have, I would say, if you want to get into programming, really? but. I think gaming created a lot of these industries that are like non-gaming now, like the you know the headset, VR headset, VR, yeah, kind of like the metaverse stuff existed in in gaming before. 
hours I spend online, I could write books, build schools, and save the world. Guilt keeps me away from video games. Guilt? I don't. Hmm. Hours I spend online, I could write. Oh, you you, like in place of all the time you spend online, you could write books, and save the world. Guilt mm -hmm. keeps you. Oh, because you would spend too much time playing the game. They can be time sinks. They can be time sinks. Yeah, but you can you can. You can make it a social. I think there are games now that are more so social, like Animal Crossing. Like you can, they, that can be that can be considered a time sink. But then you can give your code to somebody, and they can visit your island, and and you guys can play co-op together. Um, I think, what is it? Like, even even single player games for the most part, or or to some degree, can be can be social. Uh, can be social right like like just like me right now i think i spent like five minutes or a good five to ten minutes just spazzing over final fantasy 7 and i feel like as uh like because kevin has played it too right like we can sit here and talk about final fantasy and Tr corner trigger and uh the other like shadows of paradise or strangers of paradise or whatever and gush over these games because we, you know, even though I have my playthrough and he ha he has his playthrough, we can talk about you know our likes and dislikes of this this game. It's almost like a movie, right? You can we we, we could both watch the same movie and and like different stuff about it or or dislike different things about it. Yeah, I, I got an interesting question for you, man. If uh, gaming didn't get you in a program, what kind of profession do you think you would be? I don't know, man. <laughs> I really don't know. I think I think growing up, I think my backup profession would have been an electrician. Okay. I think because my dad is a my dad is a carpenter by trade, and he's he's uh very much like a do it DIY type of guy, like building houses and fixing uh fixing electrical inside of the house, and and I think I probably would have fell into that field if I didn't get into programming. I'd probably be in like accounting, hating life, or like a financial <laughs> manager <laughs> hitting you up like, "Hey guys, you need uh, help with your finances." Like, do you ever get those messages now? I don't. I um, I think I maybe once, maybe once I had somebody ping me about it, but I I I didn't really pay it too much attention. Man, I, I heard uh, some some guy was saying I don't know it, it was on Quora or something that like as a FedEx driver he usually makes over six figures and he can get up to like two hundred k. I forgot as what a kind FedEx of FedEx driver. He's a FedEx or UPS like really. I, I don't you know you know it's online so sometimes people be like making That's... you know make yeah. stuff up but i wonder how many hours he has to work though yeah i mean if, if you could make 200k would you would you do it like okay let's let's say 70k uh for about 25 hours after work 25 hours of work for 70k yeah fedex driving i don't know man driving is pretty brutal in la yeah like i i personally don't i personally don't like it I can't see driving being a a long term profession that I would I would want to I would want to do, like, yeah, yeah. Even though I sit on my butt and I I type into a computer for like eight hours a day, I just I don't know. Like, yeah, I think being a driver is gonna be stressful. Different people are just built for different things. I I might be able to do short term driving, but I don't know. I could I couldn't. I, I know I couldn't do like uh, getting in like a big rig and mm -hmm. driving like. 12 hours every day yeah. yep I, I can barely handle like a four-hour trip i'm exhausted after that so <laughs> <laughs> exactly Man, you, you know what's so crazy about driving across countries like the weather like uh imagine like a tornado is going on and you're just in the middle of some like driving on the road that's in the middle of a you know like a plane somewhere like there's no buildings around on daily entertainment then i spend memorizing scripture for most people, ninety percent of their sorry to cut you off. I, I was yeah, reading, yeah, reading a comment. his message. For most people, ninety percent of their non work time is spent online in entertainment. That's true. Not not in being productive. I really try not to spend more time daily in entertainment than I spend memorizing script. That's 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 true. 
Like I, I totally, I totally see where you're coming from. Um, and I got a great point. Let me just turn on the light real quick. All right, it was getting kind of dark, but um, I got a great point to that where, like, I'm noticing more so myself where I, I'm spending more time glued to my phone than I would like to, right? Mm -hmm. And so what really put things in perspective for me was um, like watching how much screen time I spent like on the phone, like the phone, uh, Androids and iPhones, they can tell you like how, how much time you spend on it uh, and what apps you're using the most. And I think out of an entire, like an out of an entire day, I think it said I spent five or so hours or six or so hours of my like 16 hour day uh, on YouTube. And I was like, wow, like six hours just, of YouTube, whether it be on the on in the background or me like physically watching yeah. it, it's like that's a lot of time. That's like and, the new TV. Yeah, and so today I uninstalled it. Like I, mm -hmm. I removed the app from my phone, and um, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, I'm 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 I trying to be back. <laughs> I'm trying to disconnect. <laughs> I worked at a FedEx warehouse like 14 years ago as my second job part time and. Man, I was getting paid around 20 an hour. I remember hearing that drivers were getting paid, and this was 14 years ago. Yeah, the drivers, I, that, that's that's who was uh who was really making the money. Um, don't they have like a good union, something like that? I think that's how you know they're really able to make that money. I'm surprised there's no like programmers union, but I guess people make enough money in this profession, they're kind of like, yeah, I'm good. Can you hear me, Terrence? Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. I don't, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what to say to that. I think, uh, like my dad always, my dad was a truck truck driver for a little bit. He stopped now, but they they make some pretty good money. I won't lie, like truck truck, truck drivers make a, make a decent pair of change. But you're on the road a lot. That's, yeah, same with my dad. He was a truck driver, man. It was, uh, you know, that's, that's a stressful job, man. I, I can uh, appreciate just having a job where I can sit at home and type on a computer all day. Yeah, the only stress that you have is uh, is release days, and um, and bugs and unexpected bugs. <laughs> so you just yeah, try, to, I mean, try to try to mitigate maybe. those as much as possible. You know, it can be stressful, man, especially if you're, you know, at one of these big companies and you're working on an app that, uh, you know, like millions of people are using yep. and yep. your bug is costing a company to yep. lose millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why I don't, that's, that's one reason why I can't work at, at one of these top tier tech companies. Oh yeah. I'm good on that. Like just uh, yeah. tens of thousands ain't worth that. All that kind of stress. Yeah. I'm good. I want to be able to. I want to be able to put my head down at night and go to bed and just be done. Like, I don't. Yeah. I don't want to have to think about. Did I push up code correctly? Did you know? Did what if? You know what if this went wrong? What if that went wrong? Like, yeah, no, I'm okay. No, thank you. Man, so have you? Have you been like uh, getting out like a lot more? You know, uh, trying to stay less digital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm trying to stay less digital. I've um uh slowly but surely I'm just like reducing my screen time, reducing my screen time. And then I'm noticing that that I have this itch for some type of distraction. Like and I don't know what it's what it is, but it's like you just need I, something like, I'm not, in the it's background. Like I need something and 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 I'm like I wasn't like this before High speed internet before a yeah. uh, smartphone. I didn't have this compuls compulsion to just <clears throat> have some type of stimuli, whether it's Instagram or something on in the background or whatever. And so I'm trying to sort of 
uh, wean yourself uh, off of it. Wean myself off yeah. of like always being on my phone and um and even like things like 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 I would say, okay, I need my phone to study Duolingo. Like well, I don't need that. I don't I, I can I can sit down at a computer, go on Duolingo.com and and do my Spanish lessons. Okay, cool. I don't need I don't need that app. Um, all right, I need it to read scripture or whatever. All right, well, I can, I'm sure there's a website version of the app that I'm using that I can, you know, I can just log on to read the daily scripture and then be done with it. You know, yeah. there's, 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 there's a little addiction. It, yeah. It's, it's like when you, when you make an app for everything, it just, it just means that at least in my case, it just meant that I I gave myself one more reason to just tap on my phone and not be present. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to turn my phone into something that will assist me rather than just like uh, merge with the machine almost. Like, or yeah, I, I, yeah, for lack of better words, like something it's like something that I can use versus something that just takes time away from me because eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours out of a 16 hour day on YouTube. That's, that's a lot of time. Like, you know, what, 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 what can I be doing with, with that time? That's, that's the point that I'm trying to, I'm trying to get at. It's like, I don't know if I'll, I, I don't know if I'll get to zero, but you know, it, it, it's worth a shot to try yeah. and get, to get to that point. So like, do, do do you see yourself just like being out and about more, like visiting places and yeah, being yeah. in person? Yeah, like just just being more being more present, being more present, and and being able to uh, talk to people, um, because I I I I have a habit of just sort of retreating to my phone if I don't know anybody in a, in a certain if I go to a party or if I go to an event and I don't know anybody I can immerse myself in my phone. And I don't have to I don't have to interact with anybody, but then I lose out on the experience, you know, of being present with uh, yeah. and being out and about. I can just be on my I could have been on my phone at home. I could have been on my phone wherever. Why would I go somewhere to be on my phone? It's like it's like. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to these uh, biweekly um, Street Fighter events right in any California. Yeah. And. Uh, I, you know, I'm not driving an hour out just to be on my phone and not be, not interact with people, not talk to people. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like you lose out on those memories. You lose out on those experiences. Yeah. yeah you don't really remember, like, I just sat there and uh, talked to somebody online like that, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yep. Like, you know, no old school, they had the arcades where, yeah. you, you know, you, you picture yourself being in there, mm-hmm. uh, have put in the quarter against the little arcade machine, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Like Lou mentioned, uh, a lot of people are going to the old, the old school phones where you know it's not it's not a mini computer; it's just like yeah. a phone. I've thought about it. I, I've thought about that, but I, I still I still have a need for like email and a couple of other things. There's actually a restaurant out here where they take your phone like uh, before you go in. So really, so nice. Kind of forces everybody to be in a moment and you know not in digital space somewhere. <clears throat> I, mean, I think that's a cool concept. Um, yeah, because it's just, it's just, you don't realize how addicted you are until you start to like undo a lot of the stuff that you've grown accustomed to doing. And you're like, oh wow, I'll just use my phone for this. I'll just use my phone for that. It's like, like what don't I use my phone for now? And it's like, wow, I use my phone for everything. Yeah texting talking email youtube instagram facebook the list goes on and it's like like do i need that no do i need that no don't get me wrong like there are there are there are a couple of things a couple of apps that i still use from time to time but they're purely for social purposes like like i have an instagram but i don't really like post on it that much i really just use it for the for the as a messenger app um I don't use Facebook as much anymore. Like, yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a YouTube channel, but I'm, I'm, I've got ways around that as far as like not using the app on my phone. 
Like I'll, I'll still have the, I'll, I'll still have access to it on my computer. But to me, I feel like the internet should be something that that you go to, you use it, and you put it down. Like having access to it twenty four seven all the time is just what did Kanye say? No one man should have all that power. Like it's too much. It's, yeah, yeah, they they're jacking much. everybody. We're already in the matrix, like a light version of it, like it's, a fantasy world, you know, pretty much. Like, especially when once AI really starts taking over, you know, if everybody's on a computer consuming the quote unquote content, you even know if it's real. Like how many of these articles Hello. Even our age. Hold on, you're breaking up. Oh, he's he's freezing. <laughs> you should try the old school Nokia phone. I'll check it out. If I can get one, if I can get an old school Nokia phone. Nokia C2100, 200. See, that's a smartphone too. Oh, Kevin's breaking up. We should stop calling it a phone. Yeah, it's well. That's why they call it a smartphone, right? It's a phone, but it's a, it does so much more. It's smart now. Yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be an interesting time once AI really gets to a point where like deep fakes are just gonna be really hard to tell from actual photos, and then AI voices just get really really good. It's almost, it's almost. It's gonna be really tough to differentiate between the two. Kevin, you there? Computer, his computer completely froze. Yeah, I think, uh, hmm. I don't know. Oh, all right, now I'm alone. It's a one man show. Um, what are we talking about? AI, well. Yo, Kevin. okay, here we go. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, I don't know what happened. Though. Our computer just froze up, and you all right? Uh, yeah, all carry right. this, Terrence. <laughs> 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 well, uh, the one man show is uh is postponed for now. Kevin is back. Um, yeah. that might be well, a sign we should wrap up. This out, huh? So, nothing much. We just we were just talking about um for briefly like uh not not calling phones, not calling smartphones phones. And then we touched on deep fakes and deep, I don't know, deep fake voices, I guess, or it's deep fakes, just the, the blanket term. Phones are pretty much computers now, like just yeah. handheld computers. Yep. But yeah, man, I, I, think, I think, you know, it's a good point to end it on, you know, sure, computers yeah. spazzing out and stuff. So. Yeah. Thank you for everybody for uh, tuning in this time. Um, really appreciate, really appreciate it. We'll catch you guys next time. All right, peace.